All right. Do we have any questions about any of the navigational stuff that we've done over the past uh, couple of classes? Um, I, I think, you know, you see the constant theme that we're reinforcing of separating things into different pieces, and that way you only need to update one thing if something changes. So you update the site map. XML file and your navigation changes. You update the master page and all the pages that are cloned from it changes. There are no questions. We're going to get into databases today. Um, so we'll have a bit of an intro to databases and then we'll start looking at how to actually um, merge the two, marry the two. In other words, take what's in our relational databases and put them on our web pages. Um, How many of you have had CISS 143, which is a database class? If I say no, will my grade be not curved because of that? No. I, I took it, but my professor really didn't know what he was talking yeah, about. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, too bad. <laughs> he said something about SQL. He was like, SQL, SQL? And I was just like, huh? Like, SQL? He had like an accent SQL. I couldn't understand. Did you have it with me? <laughs> <laughs> about some very basic database design principles and I, I teach this a little bit different than I did in past semesters. Uh, instead of talking a long time about databases, we'll talk about databases a little bit, do some ASP.NET stuff, talk about databases a little more, do some ASP.NET stuff and so on. What we're going to cover is Database design. Could you turn on the light too? Specifically, and this might be review for you, it might be new for you, the normalization rules. It's all coming back. It's all coming back. Third form. We will also talk about SQL, which Again, I would ne I never say SQL, so that's how I, that's the disconnect, is SQL, it's not SQL. SQL is Microsoft SQL Server, if I, uh, I, I will say that, but I'm talking about the language that says SQL. There are a couple of facets of this. There's the queries, and then there's the manipulation. There's also SQL to do definition. So for example, you can create a table within a relational database via a certain kind of SQL statement. Um, but we're not going to talk about that because that's not like a standard thing that you do in a web application. Right? The focus here is the stuff that you would do in a web application. So when I talk about queries, I, I'm talking about pulling data from. So this is like a read. When I talk about manipulation, I'm talking about adds, updates, and deletes to a table. So when we're all done, these are the topics that we'll go over and we'll talk about doing it in um, creating a relational database, following the normalization rules, and then writing some queries, and eventually writing code that manipulates the database. But first, to talk about database design. I know I've shown this graph in this class, and I show it in all the classes. The graph of where a problem is noticed and fixed versus the cost in fixing it. All right? And this is a stage of the project. And typically, there is an analysis phase, a design phase, a build phase, a test phase, and then an implementation and maintenance. 
What this graph shows us is the further along that you go, the more expensive it is, the more time consuming, and that translates to more expensive it is to fix a problem. So the motivation is to do two things, and we've talked about this before, I think. If not, we'll talk about this today. The motivation is to do two things. One is to spend a lot of time in this phase of the project where oversights are easy to correct. And again, the great analogy is the difference between an architect changing an architectural drawing versus changing an actual building. You know, once a building is built to go in and make changes of it, you know, it's going to be costly. But if you're talking simply about changing the plans, there's still going to be a cost associated with making that change, but it's not going to be as excessive as it would be otherwise. The second thing we're going to do, this is where good programming practices comes in, is trying to flatten that curve a little bit. In other words, if we do a good job and we apply good programming practices and good database design practices, instead of having an extremely steep curve, we're going to have a sort of steep curve. The curve by the, just the nature of the beast is always going to be increasing like this. But we can do our best to flatten it out a little bit. And that's why, that's where good programming and good development practices come in. So anytime I talk about something being a good practice, what we're doing is we're flattening out that curve. All right. The implication of this is that database design is real important. Because in database design and thinking through the problems, we're going to try to catch any problem, any oversights, any limitations to our database design as early as possible. And by doing a good job designing it, we're going to make it easy to change. Therefore, we're applying good programming practices and we're flattening out that curve. All right, so that's it in a nutshell of, of why this is such an important topic. First of all, let's, let's get some terms that we probably all know, or have heard at least, but I want to be precise in a definition of them so that we really understand and we're really on the same page talking about it. What does it mean when I talk about a database? What is a database? Organized data, that's good. Does anyone want to add to that? No bid's perfect. Pardon me? I said no bid's perfect. No bid? No, no, no bid's perfect. No bid's perfect, okay. Yeah, it's perfect, we're done. That's all you need to know. Three words or less. That's true. I'm certainly not going to argue that, but usually I think it's usable. Would it. relational data have to be like the same as organized? Well, I don't know. Is it? I guess organized can mean a lot of things. What do you mean by relational data? I mean, like, I know, like databases, how we are always trying to like establish like a relation between two tables. Relation between two tables all that. How okay. Everything fits together. I guess it is organized. But well, it's probably a more precise way of saying organized, though. Related data. In other words, we're not just storing the data. We are storing data and the relationships between data. So databases contain the data and the relationships between the data. And that is built right in the fabric of a relational database. That isn't something that you have to figure out. Back in the old days, we used what were called files. And files, with files, you have each entity, for lack of a better word, each piece of it is in a standalone file. So we might have a, an employee file that contains all the information about the employees. And this would look like an Excel spreadsheet, let's say. All right, this would look like an Excel spreadsheet. All right. We might also have a time card file. 
that would contain how long people work on a given day and so on. We might then have a paycheck file that the time cards are calculated and you create a paycheck. Now you could say that there's a relationship between this data, right? Because the time cards hook to the employee and the paychecks hook to the time cards and the employee. But that relationship is implicit. What do I mean by implicit? I mean the program has to figure out how it's related. So in other words, there would be rules that would say, well, the way that you match up the employee number is there's an employee ID here, and that matches up with this on the time card, and this matches up with this on the paycheck. So I would have to write programming logic to figure out how to hook these things together because the relationships were not built into the database. The relationships were built into my program. All right? And that maybe doesn't deserve a scream just yet, but it will, right? Because if my program has to contain a way of relating these things together, if it has to contain programming logic to link these things together, guess what? Any other sort of application that reads this data that needs to link these or other things together has to have that logic in there too, all right? In which case we have redundant code. We have a bunch of code that's doing essentially the same thing, all right? Why? Because those relationships are implied, figured out. It would be just like if you had a bunch of spreadsheets, and I know you can do amazing things with Excel, but I'm thinking of just your basic garden variety spreadsheet, that um, had a list of students, and there was another spreadsheet that had a list of grades. Well, what student goes with what grade? I have to eyeball it and look and say, okay, this goes with and match it up manually or write a program to do it or whatever. It's not built into the fabric of the database. Whereas with relational databases, the data and what's sometimes called the metadata, the description of the data and the description of the relationships, live in the database. So I don't have to write any special programming logic to figure out how to match stuff together. It's already matched together. The other issue you have with this is what frequently happened is you would have redundant data. In other words, there might be address information in a couple different places, for example. And the problem with that is because the data wasn't related, you might store redundant data. So you don't have to go back and look it up in the other table and figure out how to match things up. So, yeah, exactly. So you would have redundant data. And the problem with that is the problem of consistency. All right. So I might have, in the old file system sort of mentality, I might have a sales rep table that contains the sales number, name, and email. I might then have a sales table that contains the customer name and number, the sales rep number and name, and so on. And then I might have a customer file that has the customer numbers and the customer name. Now, if all my programs are working correctly, everything will, if all my programs are working perfectly, everything could be in sync with each other. It could be. But what happens typically in file systems is things happen such as there's a bug in the customer, delete, in the customer uh, maintenance program, and we end up deleting a customer that has sales out there. 
So we have sales information that exists for a customer that doesn't exist. Or we have sales information for a sales rep that doesn't exist or something like that. Why? Because my program has to, and all the programs that access this data, have to do the matching up for you. And if they're all perfect, it can keep everything in sync. Well, we know that no one's perfect and mistakes are going to be made. I went from, I worked at uh, an organization where we went and we took data from files like this. These are typically, these are sometimes called flat files or index files, but they're not distinguished from a database because they're not related. We had a file, we had a set of files and we thought our programs were good. When we went to, to implement them in a relational database, we saw exactly that case. We had orders that didn't exist for, that existed for non-existent customers. We had items on orders that didn't exist. How did that happen? Well, someone got that wrong. Someone got a customer renumber wrong. They changed the customer number and that changed it in the customer table, but it didn't change it in all the sales records. Or any number of, of bugs. So when your programs have to keep everything in sync, that's going to fail at some point. So what we do is we have a structure that contains data and the relationships between the data and is its job is to manage those relationships and make sure that those relationships are set correctly and happen correctly. So I don't have to write code to make sure that a customer, <clears throat> uh, a valid customer exists for an order. I can't put in an order unless it has a valid customer. All right. So the aim of relational databases and the superiority of relational databases compared with these file processing systems One, the databases eliminate redundant data. So information about me is going to be in one place. If I teach here, it's not like my name and phone number is going to be in one place and somewhere else my email address is going to be stored. All right, also. So it's not like that, that my email address is going to exist a couple places in the database. All right? No redundant data. And the second big win is relationships are stored and slash enforced by the database. So I don't have to worry about making sure that there's an order with a non-existent customer number. The database just won't let that happen. All right. So if I was going to define a relational database, and again, sometimes, you know, database or sometimes people say relational database, is that it typically contains multiple entities and the relationships between those entities. The advantages eliminates redundant data and enforces the relationships that exist. Make sure that nothing squirrely can happen. The technical name for something squirrely happening is an anomaly. It prevents some of these anomalies, these unusual circumstances, like a customer, a non-existent customer that has placed an order, or something like that. Now, like anything, these advantages are only achieved if you do it right. You can write a lousy relational database just like you could write a lousy file-based system. 
you know. Always cracked me up when my kids were younger, you know, we'd go somewhere and they'd say they're cold. And I'd say, well, you know, why don't you put your coat on? Oh, the, the, my coat's in the car. It's like, well, yeah, so the car's nice and warm then. The seat of the car's nice and warm, all right? Coat only keeps you warm if you use it right, all right? Databases only achieve these things if you use it right. And how do you ensure that you use it right? Well, that is the design process, and that is the process of normalization, all right? So... When I talk about entities, what do I mean? Can someone give an example of an entity in, say, a college database, possibly? Uh, a student. A student. All right. And one name another one. A class. A class. Another one. Instructor. Instructor. All right. As a general rule, and if you think about it, when you're describing a problem or problem domain, all right, or business rules, these things always all sort of fall uh, in line with each other. When you describe it, the nouns probably are relationships. I'm sorry, probably are entities. Really, we'll see that any information you get about the database can be... Um, relate to either entities, relationships, or attributes, which we'll talk about in a second here. But typically, like, the big nouns are going to be the entities. So again, you described that in terms of students, in terms of instructors, in terms of classes. An entity contains one kind of data. In other words, you would not have students and instructors as part of the same entity. All right? Again, that's something that's a little different than file-based systems. In file-based systems, occasionally you would have different kinds of data in that. Like if we did a library file system. There might be one entry in a file for the title and, and publisher and all that of the book. Then there might be multiple entries for the different authors of the book and so on. So one file could contain um, author information and book information. In a relational database, one entity, each table consists of one entity. One thing as a, as a um, just as a note, entity and table are roughly synonymous. Typically you speak of entities when you're talking about it from the design perspective, when you're planning it out. When you actually create the tables from it, when you actually create the database, then you speak of tables. But I will on, on occasion slip back and forth between entities and tables. They mean the same thing. They're the information about one thing in your problem domain. All right? So, let's consider a simple example. Let's say that we are going to do a database for um, a, a, a city's parks and recs department, and we're going to do their little league or their softball or whatever. Um, we could actually do both, right? We could do their little league baseball and their their softball. All right. And what we're going to do is we're going to first draw a diagram to do this. The diagram is an entity relationship diagram. What do you suppose the entity and relationship diagram shows? Shows the relationships between Shows the entities and the relationships between them. That's as self-explanatory as you get, I think. It's well-named. ERD, Entity Relationship Diagram. And in my mind, it's the way to start designing a database. It could just be the way my brain is wired or whatever, but by sketching it out like this and drawing the lines in between, I really think you get a sense of, a better sense of the problem domain. 
So we're going to do the Parks and, Re uh, and Recs Summer Baseball slash Softball League information. And we're going to put it in a relational database. What are some entities that exist? Teams. Teams. I'm going to represent an entity by a rectangle. What's another entity? Age brackets. Age brackets. Let me ask you this question. Will all teams play each other over the course of the summer? Not if one's baseball and one's softball. Not if one's baseball and one's softball. Not if one is 8 to 10 years and the other is 16 to 18 years. Would you need a schedule? I mean, like well, there, there, there would be a schedule, but beyond that, how do we know which teams play each other? It has to be the same sport. Well, it has to be the same sport. That's one thing. 
is there an age bracket? So if it's the 8 to 10 year olds, there's 8 to 10 year olds on that team. However, that's what's known as a derived relationship. Yes, a team has a age bracket, but the way you know the age bracket for the team is a team belongs to a league, and the league is associated with an age bracket. So yes, there is, in other words, I can say this team, if we were a, if we were a softball team, all right, let's say, we would be in the, you know, 21 through, you know, 60 league, all right? That's true, but it wouldn't be like other teams in our league are going to have a different age bracket. It would all be, all the teams in the league would be of the same bracket. Yes? Yeah, you could say the same thing about there's a, there's a relationship between coaches and players. Exactly. You could say the same thing about every single thing on that. Yeah, board. exactly. And, and, but, and, and that's a good point. Because when you define relationships, you really want to get to the heart of where the relationship really exists. All right? It is a true statement to say that there's a relationship between coaches and players. Well, maybe. Yeah. All right. Um, but really, how do you know what coaches belong to what player? Well, it's the coach for the team. All right. In other words, little Johnny, let's say Mr. Smith is little Johnny's coach. All right. If little Johnny goes to another team, Mr. Smith doesn't go with them, right? Mr. Smith is tied to the A's or whatever, all right? So the coach is tied to the team and the players are tied to that team. So in that way, yeah, there's a relationship, but it's a derived relationship. So you do have to be careful when you're defining these. Not every relationship you can dream up is a relationship that you want to implement in the database. Because remember, some relationships are, are derived. All right? And again, perfect example between age brackets and teams, between coaches and players. Yes, that's my coach. Why is he my coach? He's my coach because he's the coach of the team that I'm on. So you get to come from player to coach through the team table. Yes, this team is a 8 to 10 year old team. How do I know that? Well, because they belong to a league that is eight to 10 year olds. Yes, this team is a baseball team. How do I know that? Because it belongs to a league for which the sport is baseball, all right? So again, keep in mind that you're not gonna uh, implement every relationship that you dream up. You create, again, the proper relationship, and we'll go over some criteria for that. Now, as was mentioned before, not all relationships are the same between entities. There's typically two important kinds of relationship. There's actually three, but the one we're going to kind of gloss over for now. There are relationships that are one to many, many to many, and one to one. In database terms, for the most part, anything more than one is many. All right? So it's not like you could say, for example, I don't know how many kids would be on a little league team? 15, 20? Yeah. You're not going to say this is a 1 to 15 relationship. Well, what happens if next year, if there's a whole bunch of kids that moved into town and they need to expand the teams to 16? That's a restriction you don't want to build into the database. So you would, so there's more than one kid on a baseball team, right? So we're not going to worry about exactly how many there are. We're going to build the database as being one to many. All right? When you, so um, that would be an example of, of one to many as opposed to one to 15. One to one relationships are actually fairly rare. So that's the one we're going to gloss over. What I'm thinking of, for example, would be here at the college, the relationship between dean and division. Each division has exactly one dean. 
and every person as a dean is only the dean of one division. Okay? That would be an example of a one-to-one -one relationship. In other words, there's no tag team deans, you know, whereas for, for uh, health and nursing that these two people are the deans and when one gets tired they tag the other one and the other one comes in and argues in the meetings for a while and so on. There's one person as a dean. Additionally, if you're the dean of engineering, you're also not the dean of arts and humanities. So there is truly a one-to-one -one relationship. These are actually kind of rare. So we're not going to focus on these too much. And I'll tell you, none of these have a, none of these relationships are one-to-one. -one. All right? They're all one-to-many or many-to-many. -many. Now, when you assess a relationship, you've got to look at it going in both directions. So if I say, this is a one-to-many relationship. What I'm saying is, one of these can be related to many of these. One of these is only related to one of these. That's a one-to-many. You've got to go both ways. So you don't look and say, well, one of these can have many, so that's a many-to-many. -many. One of these has how many of these? One of these has how many of these? What this would say is one of these is associated with many of these, and one of these is also associated with many of these. In an academic environment, can you think of a many-to-many -many relationship? Student teachers. Student to teachers? One teacher has many students, and one student has many teachers. That's true. The one thing I will say, though, is that both the relationship between student and teachers is probably derivable from another. Yeah, and it doesn't, ha it doesn't have to be that way. Like in a college environment, one student can only be taking one class, only have one class. Okay, and that's a good point. It's a good point. Your example is good, but the way I would phrase it is the relationship between students and classes. Okay? One student can be enrolled in several classes. So one student can have many classes. And one class is definitely going to have more than one student. Now, to your point, to what Alan just said a second ago, that doesn't mean it's a requirement that there has to be multiple. Right. All right? There could even be one student that this semester isn't taking any classes. They're taking a the semester off. All right? But it can be multiple in both directions. So one student can be enrolled in many classes. One class can contain many students. All right? What would be an example of a one-to-many relationship in an academic context? Counselor, students. One counselor, many students. But one student only has one counselor. Okay. Or class to teacher. One class has one teacher. One teacher can teach multiple classes. All right, let's go through our softball, baseball league, and come up with some, these are called the cardinality of the relationship. In other words, what are the numbers on both ends? Between age bracket and league, what's the relationship? Go in which direction? Okay? Everyone buying that? No? Depends on your definition. Like the way we defined it earlier was that the league was broken up by ages. That's how I, I know it's good. So. Okay. I would say, uh, again, without going into any unusual or ex exceptional cases that I'm not aware of, typically one league is only going to have one age bracket associated with it. So in other words, it's not as though that this league is for 8 to 10 year olds and also for 16 and 18 year olds. All right? It doesn't seem right. It seems to me that one league is going to have one age bracket associated with it. All right? 
age bracket and a league depending on whether they play baseball or softball? Well, the way that this is defined would be that the league only has a sport associated with it. So if there was a baseball league for 8 and 10 year olds and a softball league for 8 and 10 year olds, there, that would be two different leagues. So you, you could do the same thing for sport and league and all that? All right. So the relationship between sport and league would be the same thing. One to many. In other words, one sport can have multiple leagues, right? There is 8 to 10 year old baseball, 11 to 12 year old baseball, 13 to 14 year old baseball. So the baseball can have multiple leagues. But one league is only for one sport, right? It's not like on Monday and Wednesday they're playing baseball, on Tuesday and Thursday they're golfing or something like that, all right? So one league is associated with one sport, and one sport is associated with one age bracket, or one league is associated with one age bracket. But a given age bracket can have multiple leagues, a given sport can have multiple leagues. Question. So let's make up some data, all right? Just with the three tables we have here. And I'm not going to make up, we'll talk more about actual attributes. I'm just going to sort of conceptually do some sample data here. So the age brackets might be 8 to 10, <coughs> 11 and 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. The sports might be baseball. and softball. The league, there might be an 8 to 10 year old baseball, 8 to 10 year old softball, 11 to 12 year old baseball, 11 to 12 year old softball, and so on. It's important to do this periodically to look at the data that you have and say, does my database design fit that data? In other words, that's a reasonable scenario, right, for those things. Is that correct, according to my diagram? Yeah, because one age bracket has multiple leagues. I can put multiple leagues for the same age bracket in. And one sport can have multiple leagues. Yeah, there's a bunch of baseball leagues, there's a bunch of softball leagues. Is there a case, though, of a league that exists that has two sports or two age brackets? And again, the way we're defining things, no, there isn't. But if you actually were doing this for the parks and recs, you might ask for their Excel spreadsheets or however they kept track of it before. And look and try to put the data in and look for ways that your database design breaks when you try to put real data in. Um, that's one thing that's important about database design is to, to go back and test it. And one way of testing it is by trying to add real data. And if you've gotten the relationships correct, then you can go in and add real data, and there's no problem. But if you forgot that there is a curling and ice hockey league, <laughs> all right, then, oh, I better rethink this. <clears throat> all it takes is a handful of exceptions to blow a database design, all right? So you do want to go in and make sure that there is that your database design accommodates real data. All right. Between league and team, one league can have how many teams in it? Multiple. One team is in how many leagues? Just one. All right. One sponsor can sponsor how many teams? Many? One team is sponsored by how many 
it, it can go either way, actually. I've okay. Seen, I've seen these little teams with like eight different sponsors on, but okay. I've seen them with yeah, one. Yeah. So actually, well, we'll say we'll say many. Sure. Them. Why not? We we want to have so many to many relationships, so we'll we'll do that. We'll say that one. That's something that would have to be defined by the by the building rules. Without having to, by the rules. You know? Again, and that's where exactly this is where this again. Remember, we're we're tying this to a real life problem domain. If we're doing this, it could be that different cities have different rules. It could be that Westlake says nope, one only one sponsor per team. You know. We're, we're not going to have, like, you know, all our sponsors sponsor the best team and have these poor little sponsors, poor little teams not get any ice cream after their games because no one's sponsoring them or whatever sponsors do. All right? Or it could be to say, no, you know, if you can get two teams to sponsor or two uh, sponsors to sponsor you, more power to you. All right? So this, again, would be a question that you would ask the person that's in charge. Look at their documentation, look at their rules, look at their previous, whether it be previous documents like Excel spreadsheets or whatever, to determine this. All right? In some cases, you have to apply common sense, I guess. But when in doubt, ask. All right? I can be pretty safe to assume that one team is going to be in one league. I can be pretty sure of assuming that. All right. Sponsors of teams, I don't think I would be comfortable with either assumption. Well, see, that, that could work because uh, there's some teams, like the best team, will get put in like a traveling league and all that. They'll call it. You know, they get to play other cities and all that other. So it could work both ways too. When I was a kid and all that, the best team in our like Outside of the scope of this. It's outside of the scope of this, yeah. Plus, a lot of traveling teams are comprised of players from different teams, even. Yeah, but we were just so much better than everybody. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, between coaches and teams. Well, we have a, we have a vote for everything. Okay. 
One team has to have more than one player. We're, we're agreeing on that. But in this instance, we're only talking about baseball. So one ten year old can only be on one team. On one team. He can play in the eight to ten baseball, and he can also play in the eleven to twelve baseball. No, because if he's eleven, then he can't play in the eight to ten. Because if he's ten, he can play up. But we're doing eight to ten, eleven to twelve. In this instance, if they follow the rules and not like uh, go to. Guatemala and recruit a 15 year old that's the size of a 30 year old. Boy, he's, 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 he's saying the opposite. He's saying a really talented 10 year old kid could play he's in the higher right? Yeah. Play yeah. And that's uh, again, nice. who's going to tell little Johnny when the database will take him into the uh, upper level? Uh, well, that's when coaches would go, look, you can't have a 13 year old in a old. He's going to be in tears. Well, that's when Johnny gets a good idea of what rules are and how to abide by them. <laughs> because if I know, I know Johnny's the way they, 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 if, if they didn't it. enforce that rule, there are teams down in Texas that would go and recruit 18 year olds for their 8 to 10 league and be like, look, no, 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 you're not as good. No, you're you're saying, you're saying the opposite. Kids that play with 13, 14 year olds because a 9 year old's better than 13, 14 year olds. He's talking about playing up. You can have younger kids playing older. Yeah, hey, I want to play my friends. And that's yeah, also one of the problems. It happens all the time, all the time. Jesse, Jesse, little Johnny wants to play with his friends in his peer group, but he also wants I to say play we with all go down to a baseball level. field, you know, this week, or there's probably some cold. No, I agree. One player can. Okay. They'll, they'll let him stretch the rules. Yeah, but normally they wouldn't let that same kid play in the 8 and 10-year-old league. If he was going to jump up and play in 11 12, yeah, they wouldn't let him play in the 8 10 Okay, okay but hold on. Johnny wants to play with his peers. He can't. But he also he wants to play at his own level. Johnny's going to get a life lesson here. <laughs> that that again that again would be depending on the rules of the league. No, and, and actually Alan's right because of the fact that my nephew plays in he's only like ten, but he plays in the next league up. Right. But he they told him you can either play in this league That's or usually that league because you cannot be in both. Okay. So it could go either way. Right. right? I mean it's reasonable to say that yes, a player could be on more than one team. Or the league rules could restrict and say, no, nope, a player a player would have to choose in that case. If you're good enough to be on the on the 11 to 12 year old league, that's fine, and you can play on it. But you uh, you you are then restricted and can't play on the. Can't the, play with your friends. Right. Yeah. But, yeah but, can't in play. but in this instance, as long as we're not you know segregating due to sex, he could play baseball and softball, so he could be on two. But then you might have schedule conflicts, even though I know we're not talking about schedule conflicts, but they would probably have a rule saying that they can't do that. They can only be on one team. Uh, well, well if, we can, if we can do the rule to say it can only be on one team for age groups, we could say they could only be on one team per sport, too. Yeah. All right. So we have enough many-to-many -many relationships. Yeah. I'm being very practical here. <laughs> and as by new role of Director of Parks and Recreation, yeah. I'm going to say that the rule is that a person can only play one summer league team. All right? How about if they... Let's get these loopholes. <laughs> well, I'm good, I'm good with that. I was just saying if they want to play in one, more than one sport, if there's two, two male well, again, the way this is defined, keep in mind, you know, keep in mind one thing. It's not like I'm actually setting the policy for Illyria here, all right? So if you have kids in here, this isn't like actually taking effect. This is the rules for our database. And the, the rules that we will work on, again, I already acknowledge that it's legitimate to say the rules could be that, yes, you can play on multiple teams. But, simply to bring this discussion to a close, <laughs> one a minute. All right. Now, how do you implement a one-to-many relationship? I always just click the button and uh, you put a primary access. key in there. Okay. You mentioned the word primary key. What is a primary key? 
bunch of mm, kind of right things. Well, let's formalize it. First of all, a primary key is a field or fields. It can be more than one. And it doesn't have to be a number. It, it could, be, could be a code. You know, it's a, it's a letter code. CISS243 could be a primary key in a table. All right? But the thing is that it uniquely identifies members of the entity. All right? Uniquely identifies members of the entity. A couple things about primary keys. Every table ought to have one, needs to have one, has to have one. If there isn't one that makes sense, you figure something out, all right? But you can't say, no, this table isn't going to have a primary key. Don't do it, all right? It uniquely identifies. What does the word unique mean? Unique means only one of, all right? You know, if I look, in, if I look at Jesse and say, that's a unique T-shirt. That's not true, because that's not the only one that exists in the world like that. So, so it's not a unique t-shirt. It's like an ID. It's an ID. It uniquely identifies a member of the entity. The other thing is every member of the entity has to have one. And that should be familiar to anyone who's been a student here, because you have to have a student ID number before you can do anything. All right? You can't go and, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get assigned my student ID number next week, but I want to register for classes today. Uh-uh. You need to have that student ID number before you do it. So, this could be done a couple of different ways. I'm going to create an age bracket table. that it's going to have two fields in it, an ID number and a description. later on why I'm putting an ID number. Because you might say to yourself, <coughs> that description is unique. Why not make that the primary key? And we could. But there's reasons why making a number is a good idea. And we'll, we'll talk about that later on. Right now, just trust that that's the case. All right. Lee. Sport would be similar. So we have an ID for sport and uh, the name of the sport. So one will be baseball, two will be softball. Now, I'm going to build the league table. Race this stuff.